This ship doesn't need much of an introduction. It doesn't need a fancy strapline on the review. This is the Anaconda. If it had a strapline though, it would probably be something like the Pride of Falcon de Lacy, or Boaty Ship McBoatship Face. This is the largest ship that Falcon de Lacy has to offer. Falcon de Lacy designed this ship to... Hold on a sec. Yellow. Yeah, the Anaconda. They didn't. Oh, for f so what exactly have they designed? Okay. Okay, so not even the coat. All right. All right, thank you, 07. Right, so, minor correction. As with a few of arguably Falcon de Lacy's best ships, they didn't design the Anaconda. Rimliner Galactic did that in 2856. Then, Falcon de Lacy did what they do best, which is find a company making a hugely successful ship, then buy them out. That way, it looks like they were the brains behind it. Seriously, they call this thing the Pride of Falcon de Lacy shipyards, but they didn't even design the thing. They did, to be fair, make some design revisions post buyout, but that's hardly the same thing as designing a new ship. It's like copying someone's homework and making a few small changes and then trying to pass it off as your own. Maybe it would be better if it was nicknamed the Pride of Falcon de Lacy's Acquisitions Department. Well, that was a rough start. The Anaconda is the ship that, rightly or wrongly, many new pilots will aspire to own at some point in their career in the galaxy. Yes, there are ships that can fight better, trade better, and arguably explore better, but the Anaconda can do all of those jobs so damn well, it makes you wonder if you ever needed a dedicated ship for them. Plus, it's good looking too. The top layer of this ship looks pointy but sleek, although down below it does have a little bit of a beer gut. There's an observation lounge on the front of the ship. We can't access it, but I'd wager you'd get a pretty impressive view of the cosmos from it. I'd love this to be a secondary bridge for if the primary one was compromised, but as with all ships, we have a choice of being in the bridge, being outside, and that's about it, so it's likely we'll never know. When you first take your hard-earned credits, plow them into this seemingly bottomless pit and carefully navigate the station mail slot when you take the helm, you get a real sense of size with the Anaconda, and that is not surprising. If you took five Vipers and lined them up nose to tail, you still wouldn't get to the full 155 meters of length that the Anaconda has. It's also taller than three stacked Vipers at 32 meters, and at 62 meters wide, it's wider than two and a half Vipers. Yes, yeah, so traditional metric and imperial measurements are rubbish. It's, it's all about the Viper scale. That size though, mass is an entirely different matter. You'd expect the Anaconda to be more of a chunk, more so than a person that eats their own body weight in chunky monkey ice cream on a daily basis. But at a base hull mass of 400 tons, its mass is less than half of that of the Federal Corvette. It's also lower than the whole mass of many medium ships, including the Alliance Challenger and the Federal Assault Ship. This partly contributes to the Anaconda being an excellent explorer, but we'll come back to that. The Anaconda boasts a large interior, but it does feel a little bit basic. It feels like something that was designed in the 1980s. It's very angular and just a little bit spartan. Plus, for a ship that Falcon de Lacy holds in such reverence, it really would have been nice if they managed to stuff all of the wiring behind panels or in conduits. It just looks untidy. Messy wiring would be acceptable on a Sidewinder or a Viper, but for a ship this expensive? Nah. It just makes it feel like it's been built on a budget, sold in a way to maximise profits for the company while cutting corners on the little things. Although, Credit where it's due, the Anaconda is a reliable workhorse. So maybe those cables aren't important. Maybe they're for an aftermarket mod that installs a massive sound system. Exploration can be lonely, but some decent music would help make things more bearable as you scan your 10,000th ice planet, hoping to pick out something that's actually profitable like a Earth-like or ammonia world. The view from the bridge shows the dorsal hull of the ship and allows you to watch the two dorsal class 3 hardpoints at work. 
The field of view isn't great, given the lump of ship in front of you, and there's no view of immediately what's above or below you. There's an impressive array of paint jobs available and ship kits, so you can also personalise your anaconda to your own tastes. Variety is the spice of life, and if you buy the anaconda and outfit it properly for your chosen role, you're going to be in it for a while. So, you want to make it look right. You want the galaxy to know that you splurged on this beast of a ship, and it's not just a fleeting purchase. Speaking of the galaxy knowing that you splurged on this beast of a ship, if you wanted to spread the word far and wide, the Anaconda is an excellent ship for exploration. It has an unparalleled maximum jump range of 80 plus light years, although to do that you do need to engineer the ship to be as lightweight as possible, and be very picky with your internal modules to achieve that. I prefer to run a little bit heavier and a little bit slower, but with a little bit more longevity. Either way, the potential is there to make jumping across the cosmos an absolute breeze. You also have enough room to take any equipment that you feel you need along the way, given the 8 utility mounts available and a high number of internal compartments. There are a few downsides though. In Supercruise, the Anaconda handles like a super container ship with a broken rudder. There are worse ships in this regard, the Type 10 for example, but not many, meaning that it's easy to screw up overcharging your FSD in the jets of a White Dwarf Star. Plus, if you're not paying attention and send it past the target destination, it can take a little while to turn the ship around. If you're into planetary landings and scanning biological life, you'll also have to consider the large footprint of the Anaconda and how this can affect you finding a decent landing site. Either way though, the Anaconda will let you boldly go the distance into the unknown. You just need to accept there are a couple of compromises you need to make along the way. You can also equip a size 7 fuel scoop, which makes topping up the tanks with delicious star juice an absolute breeze. As for trading and mining, you have more than enough hard points to equip all of the mining equipment you'll ever want, plus even to bring a few weapons for self-defense if the need arises. You can haul a respectable amount of cargo in the Anaconda too, with a maximum capacity of around 470 tons. Yes, there are ships that'll carry more, but they either have rubbish jump range, rubbish defenses, or are locked behind a grind to either the Imperials or the Federation. Once you have an Anaconda, it's staggeringly easy to make back the money you spent on it without firing a single shot, although firing many, many shots is subjectively more fun. Piracy and combat can be fun in the Anaconda too. It is a slow ship though, a stock Sidewinder is faster, plus it handles like a barge. This means you need to have an effective first strike against smaller and faster ships, cutting them off from escape before they can boost out of range. That's less of a problem than you'd think though, given the Anaconda's 8 hard points including 1 huge and 3 large. Although, fixed weapons may present some challenges due to the sloth-like handling of the Anaconda. Using a mix of gimbaled and turreted weapons may be the way to go. On the plus side, with an A-rated power distributor and power plant, you pretty much have enough firepower to lay down fire with whatever weapons you choose. I'd recommend switching off flight assist if you need help aiming your weapons. It allows sights on target quicker than it does with flight assist, but even with grade 5 dirty drag drives, the Anaconda will be a handful to get on target, especially against smaller ships. One other option for getting guns on is to equip the ship with a ship launch fighter and use it whilst your Anaconda follows, after the first strike of course. That way, the fighter can duck and dive, keeping the prey in place whilst the Anaconda attacks with the ferocity of a bear that's been tased in the bulls. The buying cost for the Anaconda after a few sessions in the Hazrez will almost seem trivial once you get into a rhythm with your ship. It is expensive. The Anaconda comes in at a base price of a shade under 147 million credits, or the equivalent cost of 4,592 Sidewinders. The buying cost is only the beginning. Some modules are worth over 100 million credits, so it's easy to spend hundreds and hundreds of millions overall, and you absolutely should. The stock 
E-rated Anaconda is a slow, lumbering beast that doesn't inspire the potential this ship can really do. You really need to upgrade it to get the best out of it, unless you're happy with taking on low-risk, low-reward missions. You could also argue at this point that 4,500 Sidewinders would decimate the most battle-hardened Anaconda in a straight fight, but you'd also have to employ a pilot for each Sidewinder and that would get pretty expensive after a while. Plus, it would be an absolute nightmare to organise, despite how good it would look seeing that many ships in a single fight. There is a rumour out there that if you fly to Hutton Orbital in the Alpha Centauri system, you can pick up one of these ships for free, no credit spent. But there is about as much truth in that as there is in the idea of the Easter Bunny. Obviously, this means some of you are probably about to jump into your finest ship and make that journey. Should you buy one? Yes. It's a ship that you should own at least once. Even if you eventually decide it's not for you, you can still trade it in later and get most of your money back. Is it the be all and end all of all ships? No. But it's arguably the finest multi purpose ship that the galaxy has to offer. It takes the formula that the Python laid out and dials it to 11. There is no wonder that some pilots refer to the Python as a baby anaconda. The anaconda is a ship that can take an age to afford, but once you do, you'll be making back those credits in no time. The money-making ability of the anaconda is staggering, and with an optimised configuration, no job is too small. Unless, of course, it's a data delivery to Hutton Orbital, in which case the landing pad is literally too small for the anaconda. But that's an issue that's easily mitigated, by keeping something smaller in the hangar on standby. You could argue that there are ships more suitable for every role, the corvette for combat for example and the cutter for trading, but there's no escaping that the anaconda will take pretty much any job you throw at it and excel. Plus there's no rank requirement or anything like that needed to obtain one, it's all about the cold hard cash. Personally, I prefer flying in smaller ships like the Viper for their nimbleness and speed, but there is absolutely no denying that when a tough job needs doing, the Anaconda is up to the task. It will shrug off adversity, allow you to thrive, and make lots of money, even if it handles like a boat. I hope that you enjoy these thoughts on the Anaconda. Thank you very much for watching, and if you liked it, feel free to share it, sub, like, comment, all of that wonderful stuff. That aside, have an excellent week, enjoy doing whatever it is that you're doing, and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.